One of the things I love about this presentation, especially when I do it in person, is that I'm going to ask you all to participate. And by participate, I mean hoot like an owl. So I'm going to be sharing a bunch of different owls from around Vermont. I know the opening slide says Vermont, but we're going to kind of the owls that I'm going to talk about tonight are owls that you can find all over New England. Um, and they are some that you'll be able to hear and see as we um, move through the winter and into the breeding season. And let's see, I probably, I think there's probably like at least 12 or 13 owls in the presentation tonight. So I can't hear you, but I encourage you to hoot along when I ask you to, and I'll be sharing my own owl vocalizations with you so you won't feel so alone. Thanks everybody for coming. I see a lot of really great co um, comments in the Q&A about where you're from. We've got folks joining from all over and their favorite owl in there. So make sure you take a, um, a spin and look at that. So like I said tonight, even though um, we're, we're most of us are here in Vermont, we are gonna talk about owls that can be seen all over New England. We are starting to move into the breeding season for many of these owls. Um, and so they start to vocalize a lot more. And we're also during the time of year when owls become eruptive. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, like this beautiful, gorgeous, snowy owl um, photo that was taken by Tyler Paquette um, down near Snake Mountain in Addison. So I want you to pay attention to some of the slides here. You'll see the, um, the photographer's uh, name on the slides for folks that uh, contributed slides to the show. And I'll have a thank you panel up for all of them at the end. If you ever get a good picture of a photo, feel free to send it along. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna start from the smallest, littlest, tiniest owl that's about the size of a soda can, okay? And we're gonna go all the way up to the biggest owl that's probably like mm, at least two two liter bottles, mm, maybe kind of smushed one on top of each other high, okay? So from the tiniest to the biggest. All right, here we go. Let's see who we have first. So. On each slide, you're going to see some photos of the owl, and then you're also going to see the name of the owl. And then down in the corner on the bottom of the slide, bottom right of the slide, you're going to see some little icons. And these icons will give you an idea of the type of habitat that the bird likes to be in, where they nest, and whether or not they will use nest boxes. So this is a really great way for you to kind of pay it forward for owls is by learning which owls like nest boxes, um, especially if you have property where there's habitat for those owls. So for example, with this Northern Sawit owl, we have coniferous woodlands. That's what the conifers are down there. They are cavity nesters. So they like to be in dead trees and they like nest boxes. So that gives you an idea of what you'll see on the rest of the slides in terms of icons. So let's talk about this teeny tiny owl that's like crazy cosmically cute. This is Northern Sawwet Owl. And like I said, they like coniferous woodlands and they tend to also be in um, conifer swamps and around places where there might be beaver ponds. So these are places where we can look for them. Vermont is right in the heart of this bird's breeding range. And so they're kind of scattered across the state. We don't find them much um, in the Taconic Mountains down in the south, um, but we will find them all across um, the rest of the state. And we will find them in places like Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts as well. The tough thing about these little owls is that they're secretive and they're very nocturnal and they're also nomadic. So it makes them really hard to not only find as a birder, but also to study as a scientist. So they move out and start to move out during the fall. And then they'll come back in as we move into spring and the depth of snow gets lower and lower. Now with climate change, we may see these owls stick around for longer periods of time. And one of the ways we can learn about that is by banding them. So there are banding stations in different states, folks that have special permits and training to um, mist net for the owls. These are really fine. If you think about a volleyball net and then make it like really super fine threads instead of the thick heavy threads, and you make it have a little pocket in it. 
So the bird flies into it and falls into the pocket. And the bird um, biologists, the ornithologists will come around and take the birds out of the nets and bring them back to a table where they have all of this great equipment laid out to measure the birds and weigh them. And they do it in a very set protocol so that they can release the bird as quickly as possible. For those of you who are listening in Vermont, two of the spots where you can go see banding of sawet owls include the North Branch Nature Center in Montpelier, and then also down at Snake Mountain in Addison County. Um, those of you who are listening from other states and other places in New England, check in with your local Audubon Center, or you can reach out to um, Fish and Wildlife at the state to find out if you have any banding um, stations near you. So these guys are super cute. They nest in abandoned woodpecker and flicker cavities. So if you have woodpecker action on your property, you may have saw wet owls if you have that nice um, conifer wetland mashup. Um, these guys uh, will start to um, vocalize in March and April for courtship, and then they get really quiet once they're on the nest. They love to hunt from low perches, which if you are in the right place at the right time, you have a good chance of seeing one of them. And they stash their food, so they make caches of food that they come back to to pick up for later, especially during um, like hard seasons. I think of about March and April when it gets really snowy and tough. So they're gonna stash food in different places. And they have a super cute vocalization. It's like a little tiny truck backing up. So they go boop, 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 boop. So if you listen, I'll play the vocalization. They will start singing in March and April, and they're, count, they're counter singing back and forth to one another. It's to connect with a mate and then also to establish territory. So a little bit different than our perching birds where males do most of, I'll start to say that now because the science has changed around who does the most singing. We find that both male and female perching birds now sing, but for this, there's this counter singing that goes back between male and female that we can hear across the woodlands. This photo is a photo of their ear and it's kind of strange looking, right? It's like just a little pocket. Basically the person who's taking this photo is blowing on the side of the bird's head to allow those feathers to part a little bit so that you can see, um, what would we call it? Like the ear cavity. They don't have external um, like appendages like we do. Um, it's just a little hole in the side that's right at the edge of that facial disc. And I'm gonna go back a second. So you have that nice round facial disc um, on, the, on the head of the owl. And that kind of gives you an idea where the ears are. Now the ears are also asymmetrical, meaning they're not totally lined up with each other. And that's so that they can better triangulate to find their prey. And we see this with all owls. So you've got this nice facial disc that actually captures the sound, right? Because it's kind of like a big satellite dish and it pushes all that sound back to those ears that are asymmetrical, really super cool. So it's not just a pretty face. There's a whole reason for the way that the feathers lay around the face of an owl. All right, let's meet somebody else. I might play the sound again. So feel free to hoot along with this one if the sound comes up again. Are you ready? Oh, it didn't go. So I'm going to do it, and I want to know that you're doing it too. You ready? Boop, 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 boop. That's all you have to do. Sound like a little tiny truck backing up, and you are set for Northern Sawet Owl. All right, next one. Just a little bit bigger, not much bigger than a soda can. We have this other cutie. This is Eastern Screech Owl. Again, these um, birds really like coniferous forests, woodlands, their cavity nesters as well. They're also cavity roosters, as you can see here. They like to roost and hang out and sit and spend their time even outside of the breeding season in these cavities. So having dead trees on your property is really, really important for them. And these birds will also um, use nest boxes if we put them up. Now check this out, right? Did you find the owl yet? Hopefully you found the owl in the picture here. This little one is sleeping. 
This is the adult size of the owl. It's not going to get much bigger than that, that soda can size. And it is cryptically cover, colored in order to blend into its surroundings. And we see this with a lot of owls. Those little ear tufts look like the edges of bark or the edges of um, sticks and twigs. And you'll see that later with a couple of other species. They're not actually the ear. Again, the ear is around the outside of that facial disc. These little owls weigh no more than a red squirrel. And we have both gray and red morphs, and you'll see that in a minute. In the Northeast, we tend to have um, more of the gray morphs than we do the red morphs, and that's just because of the way our trees are colored. So if we think about a shift in species of trees as we go further south with oaks and things like that, um, that bark color and um, coloration is very different. And so we tend to see more red morphs um, a little bit further south. These birds are a permanent resident and will stick around year round. They'll roost in tree cavities in the winter to stay warm and avoid other owl predators. They do need hollow trees, but they breed in a variety of habitats. And like I said, they will use nest boxes as well. The ones in Vermont nest typically in April and, and May. May and June will hear young kind of screeching um, from cavities to be fed. And then we'll have fledglings in June and July. The best thing that we can do for these little ones is to leave dead trees where they can be safe, where they're not gonna be harmed to trails or property or people um, so that the owls have a place um, to nest. Let's look at that red morph and the gray morph. There we go. Got one right next to the, the other. And you might get a better idea of size for these birds. And they have a really interesting call. There's some birders who can do this really well. And the way that you mimic the sound is to get a whole bunch of spit in your mouth. I don't know if I can do it tonight. And you kind of almost um, gurgle or um, gargle and blow bubbles through it. So it's like this, like, ooh, ooh, ooh. I can almost do it without the spit. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Not, not really good. This is not my best owl by any means, but there are some folks who can pull this off really well. So I'm going to have you listen and then give it a try at home and see if you can mimic Screech Owl. So that one is a little bit of a descending whinny. They also have another kind of little bit of a vibrato vocalization that they'll do as well. And again, we'll hear those birds vocalizing more as we move into late April and into May as they start to establish their breeding territories. All right, I'm gonna do one more and then I'm gonna pause and see if we have any questions, Amy, if you're still with me. All right, yay, this one. Oh my gosh, those of you who live um, further south than, than uh, uh, we do here in Vermont probably have had more encounters with this beautiful owl. This is barn owl, not bard. We're going to talk about bard later. And so if you kind of stacked two, if you stacked two sawwit owls on top of each other, you would probably have something close to a barred owl. These are just really gorgeous birds with that pale white facial disc that pretty much takes up the whole entire front of their face. They're pale through the front and then they have this beautiful golden brown tone across the back. We are at the northernmost edge in Vermont for the range of this owl. Although, as we see climate shift and change, that range may expand. Currently, we don't have any breeding pairs in Vermont, but we need a little bit better monitoring and reporting from folks just like you to let us know whether or not they are returning breeders to the state. 
in the late 70s and 80s and um, the early 80s were when we had the last breeding pairs here in the state of Vermont. They are also declining regionally. So if we think about through the whole Northeast, this one is um, on a number of different special concern lists for different states throughout the region. And that's mainly because of the loss of open grasslands. This is a bird that likes to hang out on the edges of grasslands. So roost um, during the, the day in the woodlands and then come out across open grasslands to hunt at dawn and dusk. And the other big piece of um, impacts on this bird are also vehicle collisions. And some of you may have experienced this during winters when we got a lot of really deep snow. We see especially barred owls, the other one, the larger one that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We see that one kind of push out into edges where the snow is less deep along roadways. And then they're waiting for rodents and things to scurry across the road so that they can pick them off. So vehicle collisions are also a big concern for some of these larger owls. Um, again, this one is um, one that uh, will respond to nest boxes. So if we do have them um, and you do have habitat near open grasslands, this is another great one that you can build nest boxes for. All right, I'm gonna pause there. And Amy, are there any questions before I Hey, yeah. So um, I, there was a question of someone asking about if you could discuss a little bit about the danger of mouse poison and also um, a question about the diet of the of the owls. Yeah. OK, so great question. So I'll do the second one first, right, because that question leads to the other one. Most of these owls during the winter months are relying on rodents. OK, so we've got moles, voles, mice. Um, if you're a larger owl, you can go after squirrels. Um, some of the bigger owls that we'll talk about later will also take out birds. So in at my house, oh, I'm not gonna tell the story yet because it's later in the slideshow. I'll tell you about what a larger owl took out um, in our neighborhood a couple years ago. Um, and then oddly during the summer months, some of these owls will also eat amphibians and insects. That's another big one. And so their diet shifts a little bit. Um, and we can think of it mainly as mammals. And then we would probably, I would probably go insects, um, especially for some of the, the smaller owls. And then if you Google this online, there are some really cool videos of um, barred owls eating um, salamanders that come to mate in the spring in the vernal pools and frogs and even earthworms, right? You think of the big rainstorms and it pushes up all the earthworms out of the ground and the owls will come down and pick those off, off the ground. Now that first question about rodenticides, um, yes, it's really important to try to manage our fraught relationship with things like rats and mice and even squirrels um, with methods other than poisons. Because what happens is the poisons get passed on to the birds and some of those poisons kill the birds right away. Um, other poisons build up over time and will end up either killing the bird or um, harming their ability to successfully fledge young. So the, another great thing that we can do is avoid using those types of poisons um, in order to control one of their main food sources. Thanks for the question. Okay, now I get to- Do we have a couple couple more? Do you have, do you have time to answer a few more? Or do you wanna wait? Related to any of the owls we've already talked about? Yes. Let's do that then. First, there's a question about the symbols on the bottom right of your screen. There are a lot of questions about that. And then another one is, um, what does the, where did the name barn owl come from? Okay, so the symbols across the bottom of the screen, and there is a new one on this screen. Um, so the circle with the line through it means that this one is not currently breeding in the state of Vermont, um, but it is breeding elsewhere to the south. Vermont. And then the rest of the symbols give you an idea of the habitat type. That's the first one. 
And then the second one or second one would be if that circle isn't there, that means that it is breeding in the state of Vermont. Um, the third one on this slide um, shows you what kind of way that it likes to nest in cavities. And you'll see some other ones coming up that don't have that same kind of symbol. And then the last one is whether or not it will use a nest box or some kind of um, human made um, device to help them with nesting. And what was the other question? Oh, barn owls, there we go, I got it. The reason why they're called barn owls is because they like to roost in barns. One of my very first experiences with a barn owl was when I was working for Massachusetts Audubon and we were at a staff retreat um, in many of these Audubon centers um, across the region um, were uh, established in old um, farmhouses with a barn. Um, if you think about Audubon, Vermont, it's an old farmhouse and a barn where the education center is now. So barn owls at this site hung out in the barn that was on the property for this education center. And we slept over at night in, outside in order to hear the vocalization. And I'm gonna play it for you right now. All right, so if you've heard that before, or you think about hearing that <laughs> in the middle of the night, in the dark, and you're walking into a barn, that's pretty scary. So there's all kinds of great stories and myths around sounds that have come from owls as well. Um, I'll talk about another like New England myth. Um, and if I forget to remind me when we get to barred owl to do that. All right, we're gonna keep going. I want you to meet this other owl that's in our region. This one is another one we where we are. Remember how I said the barn owl were at the northern edge of its breeding range? This one we're at the southern edge of its breeding range, which means it breeds to the north of us. So as we get up into Canada more, that's where the core breeding range is for short-eared owls. And here, check out the icons on the bottom right they're all different so this one nests in something scrappy on the ground that it's kind of scrapped together so in the habitats that they like to be in which are grassland habitats this is one that's going to nest right on the ground they love open grasslands fields marshes heathlands and and bogs and they love meadow voles. So they're often nomadic and will move from place to place where they can find the best number of meadow voles. So again, here in New England, we're kind of on the southern edge of their breeding range. So this is a rare bird to see, and it's kind of a casual resident or migrant. Um, we don't know right now if this one is breeding in Vermont um, or not, but we, have a feeling that it is declining throughout North America um, because they, the food source that they like tends to be a species that is further north from here. Let's see, um, what else? Did, oh my gosh, this one, when it flies, it's amazing. So it's this really like lilting kind of butterfly-like flight. And they, once again, they roost in the woodlands during the day and then they come out at dusk and at dawn to, to hunt. Here in Vermont, there are a couple of great places to see them. One is Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area down around Addison and Virgins. Um, the road in particular that you can go out to to look for this bird is called the Gage Road. And what's really wonderful is that this is on, um, let me get this right, it's the Dead Creek Wildlife Management Area. So it's a state um, run protected um, huge swath of land 
and they are building a viewing platform down there that's almost done. I was just there a couple of weeks ago with a client and they're still doing all of the welding. And it's going to be this beautiful platform that will allow you to look out, raises you up a little bit so you can look out over the grassland. And so you want to go toward the end of the day at 3.30, 4 o'clock and just wait for these beautiful birds to come slowly lilting, butterfly-like flight out over the fields to hunt um, before it gets really super dark. This bird is definitely affected by habitat fragmentation and agricultural practices where we're really frequently haying. If we think about some of the things that we've learned about bobolinks in terms of delaying haying and allowing them to um, breed and fledge their young gives them a better chance. And that's the same um, kind of practice that's affecting this bird further to the north. We don't have a lot of breeding pairs um, that we've documented here in Vermont. Uh, oh, pardon me. Um, late fall to early spring are great times of the year to So that screechy sound, we are less likely to hear because that's the sound that they're going to be making during the breeding season. It is possible to hear them in the Northeast, um, but it's not super common. I want to show you another beautiful picture of this bird. Oh, wait, let's see if I can get this to work. Oh. And then also, I'm sorry to interrupt, but maybe because I kind of talked over the last time you played the short-eared owl, if you don't mind playing it again, so we can hear it. It'd be so nice. Thank you. Another really beautiful photo that I want to. Okay, I got to go back to. Let's do that. Here we go. Barn. Short-eared. You could hear the other one kind of responding to the first one in that. And let's hope that my other my other photo is not going to work. OK, I'm sorry. I owe you a short-eared owl photo. For some reason, that one wouldn't come through tonight. I think we're, we're cursed, Amy, with tech things this evening. <laughs> it's our arch enemy of the evening. We're getting the meat of it. So this next one, so we had short eared owl and that one just the face or facial disc. And now we have long eared owl, which looks kind of similar, but has some ear tufts going on. So this one's really not well known in the Northeast. Again, we're at the southern edge of its breeding um, range. And it's another one that will move and shift depending on prey avail availability. What's super cool about this owl is they like to hang out together in roosts. So instead of being solitary, in the wintertime when they all come together and they find a good spot where there's lots of rodents, they will then go and roost together um, during the day. There's this really amazing, this, this bird is also um, found in Poland. And there's a city in Poland where there's a small woodland right near the city and it's become known as the spot for long-eared owls because the owls come in to roost at night, at during the um, the daytime in this small forest. And so the city has um, put some conservation practices in place. They've protected the land, and then they hold little outings to be able to go and learn more about these beautiful owls. I can't imagine seeing a whole bunch of them all together. So this one you can see on the slide, grasslands, shrub, scrub kind of habitat with some trees in it. And then also um, they like conifers as well. So there's a lot of different habitats that this um, bird will be able to breed in. In Vermont, this one is most frequently reported in the Champlain Valley in open grasslands, which is why it's great at the end of the day, if you're driving home from work, to maybe take a side road past all those beautiful farms and look for some of these nomadic owls that may show up. All right, I will play the vocalization of this owl and I will try not to talk at the same time. Here we go. <laughs>
All right, more of the classic owl sound, right? The hooting sound that we know. And by now we have like a really cool variety of vocalizations from the boop, boop, boop to the screechy, hissy sound of the barn owl and kind of the barky cat-like. I have a Siamese cat and short-eared owl vocalizations always remind me of some of the vocalizations that my Siamese cat makes to long-eared owl going into that more hooty sound. Really beautiful facial disc on this one with the red and the edges and then kind of the sideways white eyebrows, kind of funky looking. All right, are you ready for a classic owl? Here we go. This was one that a lot of you put in the Q&A box. This is barred owl. Their vocalization we know We've heard this, many of us have heard this. It's the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. And it's very hooty. This is the most common owl in the Northeast, the most common owl in Vermont. Um, they love a variety of different habitats from forest, woodlands, wooded swamps, um, mature forests, beech trees. Um, they can be found in a lot of different habitats and on habitat edges. They love hollow trees. So you can see down in the corner there, we've got conifers, we've got hollow cavities. They will also nest um, in old nests of raptors or crows. So if you have those around you, you can take a look for owls during the wintertime nesting there. And these birds as well will um, use nest boxes. Now, you're gonna use a totally different kind of nest box for this bird compared to the sawwet owl. And the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website um, project called Nest Watch has all of the different kinds of plans for building nest boxes. And right now actually might be a really nice time to build some nest boxes and get them up. All right, let's see. Um, what else do I wanna tell you about this? This is the one that likes to eat like frogs and worms. And so definitely Google that and you'll see some cool videos of these guys picking out frogs and worms and salamanders. We're gonna to start to move into the time of year when they're going to be very vocal because they actually lay their eggs in March um, and sometimes April. We have hatches in April and May and then young ones fledging in May and June. The young are fed by the adults until late summer. So you'll get to hear their screechy seep, seep calls to get the parents to come in and bring them food. I think I just scared my dog. He started barking in the other room. Um, so you will have a chance to hear um, the breeding pairs kind of caterwauling with each other. And we're gonna do that in a minute, okay? Together, feel free to do that at home. And um, they also stay vocal through the year. So they're very social owls. They like to stay in touch with one another. And so they have a huge range of vocalizations and they use them not only during the breeding season, but during the off season as well. All right, so you gotta get your owl face on. So get into that hooty kind of um, throat in the back of your throat. And we're gonna turn who cooks for you, who cooks for you all into an owl sound. So we're gonna go. Give that a shot. I wish I could hear you all hooting right now. And then we're gonna add <laughs> to it. The other thing is if you master this and you don't even have to get it really good and you go outside in an area where you know there, there are barred owls, you can have a conversation with them. You can go <laughs> and they may vocalize back at you. They get going so much that they start this caterwauling where they'll go. <laughs> back and forth with one another. And it sounds like monkeys. And you're like, there are no monkeys in the Northeast. We don't have them in North America. Like, what is that? And it's most likely barred owl. So you can go online to All About Birds, which is also a Cornell Lab of Ornithology website, and you can listen to all of these different vocalizations. This is the bird that has the myth um, wrapped around it 
uh, that relates to bears. So in the Northeast, and if you speak to some of the elders in our region, especially those that um, spend a lot of time on the land, folks will tell you stories about bar, uh, black bears hooting. And it's actually this bird. So when we hear about vocalizations from bears, it's more of a huffing and grunting sound that doesn't carry very far because they're, they're not doing it to, base, to communicate long distances and owls are. So when we get into that caterwauling and fragments of the caterwauling, there are all these stories that go back that people are thinking they're hearing black bears. So it's really kind of fun to trace some of those back and it's even more fun to ask the person who's telling the story to mimic it. And they'll most likely mimic parts of the barred owl vocalization. All right, let's, here's another beautiful photo from Bob Salter, who is up in um, Franklin County, up where I live in Vermont. And now we'll listen to the real thing. So it's that. And let's see how good my owl call is lately. It's been a while, I'm probably a little rusty. you have heard some of these vocalizations from this gorgeous owl and maybe you've seen some other signs of this owl around and about as well maybe something like this so this is from my backyard and i live in saint albans city in the northwest corner of the state up near the um, canadian border and uh, lake champlain and i live within you know, walking distance to downtown. And one, we had a couple of instances where um, one day we went out, we used to have the crows roost in our backyard in the wintertime because there's a whole bunch of conifers back there. And they would come in and roost in the forest out back during the night. It's only about an acre or so. And one um, afternoon, my Oh, my oldest daughter came inside. She comes running inside and she's like, mom, you're not gonna believe what I found. And I was like, what would you find? She goes, look, and she holds up her hand and she's literally got a bouquet of crow feathers. And she's like, come outside. You've got to see it. They're everywhere all over the lawn. She was probably about, I don't know, six or seven at this point. And so all the kids are out there, um, six, five and four, and they're running around the backyard picking up crow feathers. And in between all the crow feathers are like little drops of blood. And then we get over to the fence and we see like guts hanging down from the fence. And all I could think was there was an owl here because that's one of the main predators for crows. But it took us forever to prove that there were owls in our neighborhood. And it wasn't until this showed up. This is um, kind of like footprints, wing prints, and that, that mass in the middle is where the claws came into the snow. You can even see a little bit of the tail drag. If you can see my arrow here, this is like a little bit of, that's either the claws dragging in or the tail drag as it came in and landed. And we've got the, the wings hitting the ground out here. And so this shadow that you can see in the back is the play structure. It's like this domed play structure. And we figured that the owl sat up on the play structure at night and sat and listened to all the moles and the voles under the snow and then pounced to get one. And we put the yardstick there to kind of show that wingspan so you know how big that bird really was. And this was confirmation for us. It was really fun. So it kind of tied us back to our story of the, the crow feather bouquet. Pretty cool. So a great thing to look for once we get a little bit of more snow in the, in the Northeast here to be able to enjoy owls. 
All right, we're getting bigger. There's only a few more left. So barred owl is about the size of like, if you a two liter bottle of soda, I don't know why I'm talking about soda so much tonight, but that's what, that's a great like frame of reference. This next one is about two. So if you take two and you kind of cut a hole in the bottom and you slide them together just a little bit, you'll have great horned owl. So this is another one that we have um, here throughout the Northeast. This one is really adaptable to all different types of forest mosaics that we have all over the region. They need a forest near open land and they actually tolerate habitat change really well as long as there are nesting sites. And if you look at all the icons on the bottom, you can see why they do so well because they'll nest in live cavities of trees, they'll nest in dead cavities, they'll um, use uh, raptor and um, crow nests, even um, raven nests, and they will use platforms that we put up for them, as well as little overhangs or underhangs in on our buildings. So it is one that we can help out by putting up um, different types of structures for them and by managing the land in a way that'll be really um, good for this bird. Um, they also use great blue heron nests. I forgot to say that too. So if you think about, I think about driving through um, the sandbar as you head um, from Vermont out into the islands or, uh, along Lake Champlain, um, those great old great blue heron nests and osprey nests there that are close to the forest are another great spot to look for them. These guys will, um, guys and gals will nest in snow. The male will feed the female on the nest and we can see young um, in early April, late March um, going into May and then June and July is where they're going to nest. This is the second most common owl that we see in Vermont. And along Lake Champlain is really where we see most of them. Um, so this bird doesn't mind forest fragmentation um, like the barred owl and other owls do. So it's probably gonna be one that'll stick around a little longer. And it's also one that eats the little owls. So it's got a, another huge um, kind of variety of prey that it enjoys um, and won't have a, too much of a hard time finding what it needs to eat. This one has a deeper voice to it. So you have to get down into your lower register and they do a who's awake me too. So it's kind of like ooh, 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 really, really low. So give that one a try. So you're just gonna do a who's awake me too and make it, make it a little breathy, all right? See if you can do that. Ooh, 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 ooh. I think I gotta work on that. Let's listen. All right, that one, these guys are also, you could hear in the background of that audio, I think some of you may have heard the crickets. And so this is another social owl. And like the barred owl, you can kind of master this vocalization and go out and hoot to them um, during different times of year and see if they will vocalize back at you. All right, so these, the ones that I've talked about are kind of the, so far are the, the ones that we have the best opportunity to have experiences with, whether we're going out on an outing that's specific to owls or we get a chance to see them on the side of the road or um, we're in a spot where there's just great habitat for them. These are the owls in New England that that are the most common, even those two that were the uh, Right, two, right? I did long eared and short eared um, are the, the migrants and the nomadic ones. The next set, we're going to start little again. And these are the ones that are less common um, and I don't know, kind of spectacular. All right, so we're going to do a little one. So go back down to that Coke can size, like the Stawet owl. Um, this one is super tiny, 
no ear tufts, yellow eyes, white face, which is really important. And I want you to pay attention to the eyebrows here because I'm also going to um, show you a picture of saw wet so you can see the difference and dark throughout. So it's like this chocolatey dark brown rather than the soft brown tones that we see in saw wet owl. Um, this one mainly breeds to the north of us um, in the Canadian boreal and montane forests, and it's often mistaken for a saw wet owl. But we have had reports of them in Maine and New Hampshire and northern Vermont at one time, but they're not likely a breeder here anymore. These, are, these birds are really sensitive to clear cutting and other forest management practices as they like dense coniferous forests. And so here's Sawit. This one's a little bug-eyed, I think, because of the flash from the camera. Um, so make those pupils a little less um, lemony, or the iris is a little less lemony yellow, and the iris is a little darker. But you get the warm brown tones from this bird. And the face is less um, white than it is kind of there's a brown wash to that as well. Um, if you come across this bird and you think that you have a boreal owl, make sure you try to get some pictures or report it, take some really good notes, and let your um, state bird records committee know. All right, how about another one? Northern hawk owl. Look at this one. He's so fierce. It's got eyebrow. There's no eyebrows on this one. It's like they're just gone. I'm just going to give you all speckles all the way down to the beak and a really intense stare. That facial disc is outlined in like deep black. Um, and this bird is a daytime percher. The reason why it's called a hawk owl is because it's often seen during the day and the way that it holds its body when it sits and perches, I'm gonna show you another picture here, is it often has that same silhouette as a hawk and is mistaken for it. We have seen this bird erupt into the Northeast during the winter time and it will push down when food sources like um, moles, voles, mice, bog lemmings, all those little guys are not around. So this bird is way up north, circumpolar boreal forest kind of bird. The cool thing about this bird is if it finds a really good spot for food, especially when it's eruptive, it's going to hang out there and it's going to stay. So we have a good chance of being able to go and safely and kindly see this bird from a distance. Um, so this one um, also has um, similar hunting habitats to going over um, open grasslands and likes to roost in coniferous um, woodlands during the night instead of the day. Here's another great shot of this one. I love this one because it's very inquisitive, kind of checking out the photographer, Bob Salter. And so you can kind of see how that, the way that that bird is perching is a little bit more hawk-like than owl-like, and they'll often perch right out in the open. All right, now we're on to the showstoppers. Are you ready? Ooh, who are the two? I think it's just two left. I think we only have two left. Who are the two owls that we haven't talked about? How many of you are Harry Potter fans? Okay, if you were holding up hands, I'm sure it's like a lot of you, or at least you've got kids or grandkids that love Harry Potter. So here's Hedwig. Right, we got to talk about the snowy owl. This is another one that's eruptive, which means it's going to push down into the northeast um, when uh, the food resources up north aren't as great. And this bird is also diurnal, which means you have a great chance of seeing it during the day. They will hunt during the day and stick around certain places where they keep finding food um, plentiful. November and March are peak times to see them here um, in the Northeast. Now, we're gonna learn a little bit about the difference between um, being able to identify male from female. So young males have a pure white bib under the chin, okay? And the back of the head is entirely white. So this one is a young male and the barring on it is, is very pale. I'm going to show you the next one. Oh my gosh, they're just so cool. And those eyes, right? All yellow with the, the dark pupils. Here's um, 
a female. They have extensive black lines through the feathers. So this one's very, very dark. This is our, our female. And this next one I'm going to show you. Oh, it's so amazing from Tyler Pocket. This is another male bird in flight. So the, the main reason that this bird and probably the northern hawk owl as well, because that one's a circumpolar um, kind of habitat lover, is that the continuous light of the Arctic summer makes it impossible for this owl to be nocturnal. So it holds a totally different feeding niche um, than any other owl. Um, in, a, in a good year, these guys need about 1,600 lemmings to be able to survive. This is a, the heaviest owl um, that we have in this region, um, weighing in at, at about four pounds. And what's a bummer about this bird's um, mm, food preference and where it lives, right? If we think about how climate change is going to affect the Arctic, it's gonna impact um, lemmings and lemmings ability to survive summers. That's not a little mammal <coughs> that is built for heat or warmer temperatures. So in turn, um, our snowy owls may be affected. There's some great National Geographic programs that you can watch on this owl and you can see them where they nest and breed right on the ground in these grasslands and some of the things that um, they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis to help their young fledge. Okay, drum roll, everybody. Drum roll for the very last owl. This is the biggest owl, but it's probably not the heaviest because it's mostly feathers. And it's one that we get to see every once in a while in this region. It's another eruptive owl. Um, and what's really um, kind of bizarre about this owl is it's not used to interacting with humans. So it often comes very close to people or doesn't disperse when lots of people come to look at it. So this bird is about two feet tall and it has a five foot wingspan. I'm about five foot four. And so just a little bit shorter than me in terms of their wingspan. So that's that's pretty amazing. They are extremely rare in the Northeast and every once in a while, they do push down into this region. Now this bird's nocturnal, so you're gonna have a better chance of seeing it at dawn or dusk. And it's been most commonly seen in the hills of Northern and Central Vermont here and similar types of habitats in New Hampshire and Maine. I don't know if one has ever made it down to Massachusetts. These birds can be mistaken at first glance um, for a barred owl, but you'll notice that that facial disc is really almost as if the whole bird's front of its face is flattened and the disc is very, very wide, right? So there's no head beyond the disc at all. And we have those two kind of vertical eyebrows there um, that kind of accentuate the eyes and the dark line um, down to the beak. And then as you get into the bib here, see those nice two white stripes? That's another thing that you won't see on the barred owl. So its body mass, for this bird, even though it's probably at least six to I don't know, probably 10 inches bigger than a barred owl, it's 15% smaller in terms of body weight because most of that bird is all feather because they breed up in the north. Remember how I told you that they're not really used to um, people? They really like places to perch and hang out like this bird box, or they might end up doing this. It's just kind of incredible. This was in um, New Hampshire. This is a photo taken by David Lipsy. And there were um, there was an owl that was coming. And I think this was in the 90s or the early 2000s. And this bird showed up um, around the, what is it? The Connecticut lakes that are way up north in northern New Hampshire. And this individual ended up perching on this person's head as the person was trying to, to just observe the owl and a photographer got a great picture of it. I don't know how the person's head felt afterwards. I wish I could have had a conversation with them. I don't know if I'd want 
those talons, like you can see a little bit of the feet here, um, digging into my head. You can see in this bird, this is another beautiful image by Tyler Paquette. Um, you can see the legs trailing out the back and the fact that they are covered in feathers. And that's a really good indicator that this bird is adapted to um, winter time. And so another bird that's probably going to struggle a little bit with climate change because it's really kind of evolved to be able to um, adapt to um, harsh winters. Yeah. All right. So now that you've all fallen in love with owls, we have to be good caretakers of the owls. And I want to give you a few things as we wrap up here um, that you can think about doing to kind of help out. Um, one is leaving standing dead wood when you can, when it's safe. Um, and as you saw in the slideshow, uh, many of these owls like um, snags or dead trees to be able to nest in. When we don't have that, we can put up nest boxes and you can look up different um, patterns for nest boxes online on the Nest Watch um, site if you'd like to put up some nest boxes um, near you. The other big piece is to really minimize disturbance. This is a huge problem within the birding community and the photography community where um, folks get excited to see some of these eruptive birds and then they make bad choices. And so many of us in the birding community um, have started to uh, not divulge where birds, be, birds like this, owls like this are being seen in order to better protect them. So know too that with any bird, um, especially some of these larger um, birds like owls, even the small ones during the winter time, especially they're surviving. And our presence, even though it may not spook the bird, it's causing stress for the bird or it's also scaring their prey away. So we wanna minimize disturbance, visit from a distance, visit for a short period of time. Um, and when in doubt, keep that, keep that secret close to you about where that snowy owl or the great gray is in order to protect it until we can do a better job at being um, kin to these birds. Here's the rodent trip thing. When controlling rodents, opts for traps rather than poison work to decrease habitat fragmentation in your community. As a landowner, you can delay cutting grasslands. That'll be a big help to some of these birds that both hunt and nest in those areas. And when you can, individual reports are key to understanding owls in Vermont. And there is a way to report owls to the Vermont Birds Records community or the Vermont Center for Eco Studies or Vermont Fish and Wildlife so that we can get the data that we need in order to better understand where these birds are showing up and we can protect them as well. All right. Big thanks to the photographers, Zach Coda, John Van Hosen, Tyler Paquette, Robert Salter, and Joanne Russo. You can find out more about my programs at my website at birddiva.com. I'm on Facebook, on Instagram, and Twitter, um, all kinds of things. I am also teaching about slow burning. So if you're into a more mindful practice around birding, um, reach out to me. You'll find a lot of information about those core programs on my website. And at this point, Amy, I would love to hear any lingering questions. Yeah, we've got quite a few. So there are quite a few folks who are curious about the vocalizations of some of the um, the owls that you mentioned um, that were more rare. Yes. And the reason why I didn't play them um, is because we don't always have a great chance to hear them. And it gives you something to go and investigate yourself. So again, one of the uh, I, there's two great ways to do this. One is to go to the All About Birds website. That's through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can also download an app called Merlin. And Merlin will um, has, it's like a field guide within the app. Merlin can help you identify birds by sight and by sound. And it also has an explore feature. So you can pull up different owls and you can listen to their vocalizations and you can see the spectrogram. So the visual, that goes along with the vocalization that you're hearing. So those are some ways to kind of um, uh, extend the learning on your own um, and learn some of those um, vocalizations that we may not get a chance to hear in the Northeast. Great. Um, a question about, are all short-eared owls in New England light 
fades? Ooh, are all short-eared owls in New England light phase? You know what? I don't know that. Um, and I don't know, I'm not aware if they have a light or dark phase. So I'm going to my favorite bird guide here, which is Sibley's, and we'll see if we can um, look for um, my owl section. There's owls. And we'll ask David Sibley. So short-eared owl. We have, um, let's see, northern adult, da, 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 da. adult female. We have some that are very pale. The male is, is darker underneath and the female is very pale below. So I think that may be that color change that you're looking at. So not necessarily a different morph from what I'm seeing on the Sibley's page. It's that males tend to be darker underneath on the underwings and the females tend to be lighter. I don't even know if I can make this come up on the screen and then I gotta do the backwards thing. So they are right here. So there's the male and the female. Oh, that's not the right one. Nope, it is. Okay, good. When you pull them up to the camera, you gotta do everything backwards. So the male is on the left and the female is on the right in flight there. And so you can see one's paler and one's darker. Hey, thanks to whoever answered or asked that question because I learned something new tonight too. Thanks. Awesome. I love that you, uh, as a librarian, that you referred to a book. Yes, um, yes to of course. To do that research. <laughs> um, you mentioned, well, first of all, you also mentioned that um, we would like to minimize disturbances of mm -hmm. birds, but um, you mentioned that there are two places to find short-eared owls. You mentioned Dead Creek. Can you reveal the other one? Um, the other one, yes, I can reveal the other one because it's another um, management area. So it's the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge. It's been a long time since um, we've had short-eareds show up at that site. But um, again, it's what's great about this, and this is about learning the habitat. So if we think about Dead Creek, Dead Creek, I mean, creek, and there's wetlands, it's a whole wetland complex up against agricultural lands with these forest mosaic patches, okay? So that's the type of habitat that they really like. And we have similar habitat up here, which is, I live very close to Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge, with Maquam Bog that is between the lake, then you have the bog, and then you have a bunch of agricultural fields and like some patches of, of woodlands, forested, bog, um, swampy kind of areas. And so that's where we've seen um, short-eared owls as well. If you drive out the road, it's called Tabor Road where the visitor center is. Um, and I do this every once in a while because it, I think it was probably my kids were my kids were very young when we went. So probably about five or six years ago, um, they had two or three that would come out and hunt those fields at the end of the day. And it was, wow, it was just such a treat to see them. Thank you. Um, what are barred owls saying to each other? Yeah, <laughs> what are they saying to each other? Um, yeah, I don't know that we, I mean, totally know. We know that a lot of it is to say, this is my territory. This is where I am. So when males are vocalizing, you can tell the difference between male and female barred owl vocalizations because the males, the, the on the end is, is very smooth. And what the females do is they do a and it has a little bit of a vibrato on the end where it kind of kind of bounces a little bit. So males are establishing territories when they start to get into the breeding season and there's this counter um, singing or counter calling that goes back and forth. That's about connecting with a, another pair of uh, another a mate. I don't want to say another pair because they're not pairing, up, not pairing up with other pairs. So they're connecting with a mate. And then, you know, the caterwauling, I'm not sure that we know too much about. It's really interesting that um, there's still things that we don't know that we need to do a little bit more research into. So we have the caterwauling. I think um, when I have experienced it, it's been um, either, between, uh, e either between individuals that are already paired, or sometimes it's when there's 
um, either another male or a second female in the area. And so they all get going together. Um, and then you have the young, the, the fledgling call in order to get food. So that's a begging call um, to get the parents to come in and feed that individual. Um, but yeah, I think there's still a lot more to learn, especially about the barred owl vocalizations and what they mean. And you know what that means? That means more slow burning, more spending more time in one place with one species and looking at the big picture and kind of getting to know it a little bit better. Sounds like fun. We have a few more. Um, these two questions kind of go together. So when an owl has ear tufts, yes. is the structure of the ear still the same as you spoke of earlier? And can great horn owls put their horns down? Ooh, yes. Okay, so yeah, yes, the ear structure is still the same. So the tough, because we call them ear tufts, they're they're not really associated with the ear. It's more of a um, of a feature to help them blend in with their surroundings. Take a look at different pictures of some of the owls with ear tufts, even like little screech owls and. If you think about backing up, even from the photographer's perspective and zooming way out, that owl is going to blend in so well with all the sticks and twigs and things that are around it as it's perched. So it's really about camouflage more so than it is being associated with ears at all. And I do believe that they can tweak those ear tufts, right, and kind of show, hmm. I'm gonna go out on an edge here, kind of emotion, like where they're at, what they're feeling. Are Am I alert? Am I um, on watch? Am I in conflict with another owl? Am I listening um, really well? And I'm about to have, um, you know, a, an owl off with another owl that might be in my territory. So yes, I think they can kind of um, flex and move those feathers as the situation warrants. Okay, just a few more. Is there a better yeah. time of year to watch and listen for owls? Oh, you know, because barred owls are so common, I feel like any time of year is, is a really good time of year um, to be able to go out and look for barred owls. I think there's probably times of year when they're more vocal. As we move into the breeding season, you're gonna hear more vocalizations across the land. And so that might help you find them. Um, and then I think the other way that that you can have better um, experiences with owls is just getting to know different places, getting to know the types of habitats that they like and the landscape that they might be in, and then go and spend some time in those places in different times of day, right? I think a lot of times the birding community is all about getting up really early in the morning. And when you want to see owls, it's a, it's a nighttime thing. So spending some time outside at night can be really helpful because um, often you'll hear them first before you see them. And then of course, there's always those special moments when you just encounter an owl and you're just in the right place at the right time. Thanks. So I think that you kind of answered some of the other questions with your answers. But one thing I just wanted to repeat, there was a question about um, nesting boxes. And you definitely did mention um, that there were different types of nesting boxes um, on the Cornell College of Ornithology's website. So yeah. would that be the place to go for that? Yeah, so it's called Nest Watch. And if you go on that website, you can look up um, literally different patterns um for building boxes for different owls actually all different kinds of birds um so it's a really great resource and you just download the pdf and then get going in the workshop you'll be all set okay we still have some more is there a way to tell how far away an owl is when it's hooting oh geez <sighs> I think, again, that probably takes a lot of time and practice to be able to do that. I know I have been fooled by how close or far away I think owls are. I've had some, the very first time I ever heard 
the hissing, that sound of um, begging fledgling owls. I, so I had been outside at the end of the day working in the garden and I kept hearing this sound over and over again. And it would literally raise the hairs on the back of my neck and I couldn't find it and I couldn't figure out exactly where it was coming from. And so I sat in the woods, I took a couple steps out of the yard and I sat in the woods and I called like a barred owl because oftentimes barred owl vocalizations will draw other birds in. And I figured that maybe if it was a bird, if I drew other birds in, I might figure out what it was. And what I ended up doing in sitting there and hooting like an adult was I brought the baby owls in and they were actually much closer than I thought. And there were four of them. There wasn't just one. And then I felt really bad because I was like, oh, I'm not the adult that has any food for you. So I stopped right away and um, I apologized and I backed into my yard and hoped that the adults would come in and feed those four babies, which they probably did because we had them year after year after year nest in that in that spot where I was living. So I think it takes practice to figure out and to kind of fine tune your ear to how far um, an owl is away. And they're very right. The whole purpose is to be able to communicate through a woodland. Do you think about pushing a vocalization through conifers um, or across an open grassland? Like what does your volume have to be like? What does that tone have to be like? And so I think it could be tricky. Okay, last question of the night, because we are going to be respectful of your time and everyone else's as well. Um, do owls overlap territories with other breeds of owls? Yes. And there are some that don't like to overlap. So barred owl and great horned owl tend to not um, share similar habitat. So if you have um, great horned owls in one area, you won't have barred owls. And those larger, those larger owls, unfortunately, will prey on some of the smaller owls. So once those larger owls come in, the other ones will kind of push out and away. Um, the grassland owls seem to do better at sharing habitat. And then you have the ones that are diurnal. So right there hunting in different times of day. We have to realize too that like we have diurnal owl owls, we have crepuscular owls that are dawn dusk owls, and then we have nocturnal owls that are nighttime hunters. So that's the other way that when they do share a habitat, they can overlap with each other because they hunt during different times. Bridget, thank you so much. Thank you for being here tonight. And thank you to everyone who is joining us from, from home on the Zoom webinar. And we have a few folks who are here in the library watching the Zoom webinar on a big screen. And thank you for your patience with the technology. And um, we're so grateful to everyone for being here and the Lamoille yeah. neighbors. And I forgot to mention at the very beginning that, that this is sponsored by a grant from the Copley Trust. Super. Can we do one more owl hoot together? Yeah. Okay, let's do barred owl. So we'll do who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. All right, are you ready? Amy, do I get to hear you try? All right, yep. Okay, good, here we go. <laughs> yes. We have some people here doing it too. Thank you all so much. Have a great winter and be in touch. I love your bird stories. So feel free to email me at birddiva at geomail.com and check out my website as well, birddiva.com. Thanks everybody. Thank you.